Hello and uh, welcome to the SVS in the worldwide stereo community. Uh, my name is Nick Brown. I am the VP of marketing for SVS and uh, we have some very awesome guests here today to talk all about the uh, wonderfulness of home theater. So I'll start on the uh, lower part of the screen. My colleague at SVS, our national training manager, Larry Magoo. Larry, how are you this evening? I am great. Hello, everyone. We're excited to be here. We've Love doing these broadcasts with everyone out there. And I see the comments coming in. So we're pretty stoked for this. Yes. And thank you for getting dressed up in a uh, festive outfit for the evening. That's uh, very, uh, you get rewarded for that. So uh, kudos to you. And uh, joining us from uh, Worldwide Stereo, uh, we have Brian Soudin and Ryan Rumor, although appearing on screen, they're actually switched. Uh, I'll start with you, Ryan, since you're on the left. Uh, how is it going this evening for you? It's going great. Had a nice day of work and ready to have some little fun tonight with everyone. Excellent. And and Brian, I see that you're tuning in from uh, what looks to be a, a showroom there. Am I correct? Where exactly are you guys located? So we're located at our uh, 309 um, showroom, which is uh, our, you know, has been our home since 1979. So uh, we call it our Montgomeryville store, our 309 store. We call 309 because we're right off the, uh, we're right <laughs> off of uh, 309 uh, the road. So uh, awesome. Many different names. And you actually have two showrooms, am I right? That's correct. So we have Montgomeryville our, and Ardmore, Ardmore. Uh, down on the main line. Correct. So basically what we're trying to do tonight is, uh, I mean, officially we're calling this the essentials of a thrilling and immersive home theater experience. Uh, so basically this is going to be a, a 101 level course uh, where we talk all about the elements that go into a home theater and how to create just a stunning experience that you can get from you know your traditional pro level cinema, but in your own home. And uh, everyone here is smarter than me, so they have all sorts of tips and uh, <laughs> advice to get you there, choosing the best products, setting things up, really making it the most it can be so you get that awesome experience. Um, but that's not all. We also have a fantastic giveaway uh, for the evening. It's a uh, SVS Prime Satellite 5.1 surround sound system that consists of five of our Prime Satellite speakers, uh, as well as our award-winning SB1000 Pro subwoofer, which includes the SVS subwoofer control app. And uh, we'll include all of the sound path cabling uh, as part of that as well. So uh, all you got to do to be eligible is leave a comment, ask a question, one entry per person. We have our colleague working behind the scenes. At the end of the broadcast, we'll choose one person at random to, uh, to basically... Be the winner of that, announce it live on air, reach out, get all your contact information. Good luck to all of you on that as well. Uh, but before we get started, I did want to give uh, Brian and Ryan a quick opportunity to talk about uh, Worldwide Stereo and basically uh, just what you guys have available in your showrooms before we get started. So uh, Ryan, I guess I'll start with you. Uh, just give us a quick idea of what you have available for people who do want to come to your Ardmore or Montgom Montgomeryville locations. And then I might pop up a quick demo system shot on screen while, uh, while you're talking here. Yeah, so both showrooms are, are set up as uh, possible rooms in the end user's home. So we have individual systems in, in private rooms that are just maybe a single system or two systems. Um, this shot you're seeing here is in the middle of our Montgomeryville showroom. So it's more of like an open floor plan, uh, private media style room with a big TV, a nice surround sound system powered off a receiver. Um, we do have other displays such as lighting and shades in full home control that can control the whole store or control parts of both stores. So we've really adapted uh, our showrooms over the years to really cater to even more details that the end consumer uh, may want or need in, in their home. It's like somebody's dog's not happy right now. Um, yeah. And, you know, okay. as far as right. you know, the technology that you guys have available, it's not just home theater stuff. Uh, Brian, what sort of things outside of the traditional audio video uh, type technologies are available to uh, to view and demo at the uh, Worldwide Stereo showrooms? So the, the showrooms actually have a lot of different options that you, you can uh, kind of play around with. Uh, a big thing is lighting control, or and and not just lighting control, but lighting itself. Uh, we have. Uh, a Lutron system that one button can turn off every light in the store. Uh, and that same button could turn on all the lights in the store. And uh, we have it coordinated with one of our control systems to turn on all the televisions in the store. So when the sales guys show up, they only got to press one button and everything's ready for everyone to look at. And I, I talked about lights. We have different LED lights. Um, so uh, we have fixtures for sale. Uh, and then I know we were, you know, not just talking about audio and video, but we sell uh, you can see them in the background. Um, 
acoustic panels, which make your rooms sound a lot better. So uh, a lot of what we sell is about that experience and that comfort of, okay, it's not just the television and the speakers. It's, uh, you know, an aesthetically pleasing acoustic panel that'll make the room sound good. Uh, we have lights that can make the room look good as well. Uh, and we have a control system that makes it real easy to use. So we have a, a whole lot of that at our Montgomeryville store. We also have an entire car department. Uh, so if you want the, the, your car sounding good as well, uh, they do phenomenal work. I think they've worked on probably every one of our employees' vehicles at one point. Um, <laughs> so really, uh, I mean, you guys have everything covered there. And, you know, yeah. Short of the technology and the products, uh, it's worth noting that uh, Worldwide Stereo has installation services and also any kind of expertise. You know, you've got questions about how to mount a TV, how, where to place your speakers, you know, how to integrate all this stuff seamlessly so it's not visually taking over the room. Uh, their team can really be an asset in terms of uh, getting you all that knowledge and getting you set up right. And hopefully tonight we'll be able to share some of that as well. Yeah, and a phenomenal website where you can go and check out all the cool stuff that they do as well. Uh, I've shopped on Worldwide Stereo website for years and uh, have quite a few pairs of headphones and other gadgets and stuff that I've acquired from them over, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, I'd be you'd be amazed how often I'm on our own website just to look up information, uh, just because if I'm looking for a specific TV or speaker and I want to know the size, weight, or anything specific, I literally skip back, skip past the manufacturer's website and go to ours because one, I know it's the piece that we're selling and two uh it's not just it, it includes all that you know granular information as well uh not just like hey here's a speaker it sounds good but like how much it weighs how much it weighs in the box you know those little details that uh me when i'm working on the installation side uh or setting up those installs it's also important Awesome. So if you are in the Worldwide Stereo uh, neck of the woods, which is the Montgomeryville and uh, Ardmore area of uh, Pennsylvania, check them out in person. And if uh, you just want to make a road trip to somewhere cool, you can also check them out there. But like Larry said, the website's also a phenomenal resource. Uh, so with that being said, I think we're ready to get rolling sort of into the main portion of the evening. Um, and SVS is an audio brand. Uh, we make wireless audio products, subwoofer speakers, uh, cables, accessories, all that stuff. But we're talking about the full spectrum of home theater here. And I think uh, most people uh, outside of our spot would would uh, you know think of displays and, and TVs as one of the first elements you need, that screen, which really ties a home theater together. So with that being said, uh, I'll kick it to you, Ryan, first to say, you know, if you're in the market for a display, whether it's a, a TV or a projector, what are some of the first things you should consider when you're shopping for uh, those types of products and, and you know, considering them for your room? Yeah, first thing I usually ask is how, what, what, where, what room is it going in? How, how bright's that room? Um, what's your seating distance? How close do you want to be to that picture? Where are you going to sit like in this theater if we're doing that or in this media room? So I usually kind of throw it back to them. I was like, hey, when you go to a movie theater, where do you sit? Do you like to sit right on top of the screen? Do you like to sit where your periphs are? seeing parts of the screen where you have to sit far back to where you can just sit your head there and just not have to turn your head or do the do the ping pong thing. So that's kind of where I start with making sure we get the correct size screen in the room or correct size TV. And then there's a power of 10, where like every 10 inches, you're back. What's, I'm bad at math. I'm sorry. What is it? <laughs> it's, it's like the rule of 10 uh, is essentially... Uh, the suggestion is for every inch of your screen, you should be 10 inches away uh, is, a, is a good method for saying, OK, this is a comfortable spot to sit. So if you have a 60 inch television, that's 60 inches away, which is six feet. Right, Ryan? Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> but it's five feet. But uh, but it, that idea gives you that idea of where your comfort zone is. And that's a good middle ground for a lot of people to start uh, and kind of uh, saying or coming off of what uh, Ryan's saying is. I'll usually ask, is this a dedicated room or is it going to be a multi-purpose room? Um, the size of the screen really depends on that because a lot of the, uh, you know, open house designs where the kitchen is right outside of the living room, that person in the kitchen is going to be watching the television as well. Does it want to be big enough for them to be able to see it from the kitchen as well as in the living room? You know, what's that comfort level with that distance? Uh, but if we're talking like dedicated rooms and we're talking about 
um, you know, a dedicated uh, home theater or home cinema experience, that's where size, I think, is really important for that uh, immersion feeling, like really being part of the experience, you know, closing the doors, turning the lights off and, and just dedicating your time to watching or listening to something and and being almost overwhelmed by 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 what you're watching or what you're seeing yeah Yeah, i think one of the ways is explained you want it to take up your complete field of vision because when you're not seeing you know decor and you know whatever else you have in the room you are completely in the scene you know you are pretty much as close as you can be to in the middle of the action when you have that full field of vision taken up um so i think that all that's great advice about you know the distance and the size of the screen and i'm gonna flash another quick uh uh, screenshot up here and Larry I'm going to ask you what is wrong with this scene as far as the placement of the display goes well it's, it, it's not necessarily wrong but not typically the best recommendation I saw some people talking in the comments too about where their televisions are above a fireplace and in some rooms it's unfortunately the only place it can go but it's also extremely uncomfortable to sit there on your couch and watch though aesthetically it may look cool So we we tend to recommend getting them about even with your head when you're sitting down. Or if you're going with a larger screen, that does uh, benefit you. And you guys were talking a minute ago about somebody maybe being in a kitchen or a secondary room watching. So that's also where the mounting comes into place. And we've brought this one up a few times where we talk about the mount that you can uh, actually articulate downward Mm -hmm. from above a fireplace. And so that would make things more comfortable or use a mount that you can turn towards your other watching space. So... You know, my my room downstairs, my living room, kitchen and hallway are all kind of one big space. And I've got a big old huge TV that I've had forever. It's an older 58 inch Panasonic plasma that I'm just not getting rid of because I love it. And it's in a corner so that we can totally see it from the kitchen or the hall or the television room. And you know, sometimes that works, but not in every case. And so whether it's mounted on the wall like the TV behind you guys sitting on a piece of furniture, sometimes it's just the only place it can go. But if you do need to mount it up high, you know, doing an articulating mount is really nice. This one, a little bit of an angle would help with some of that glare, too. Uh, so it, there's a lot of things that come into play. And then also it's got to be aesthetically pleasing for everybody, too. Yeah, I would. And to that point, I mean, I think the, the system we're showing right now does a great job of sort of integrating the equipment uh, with the room decor. You know, I think that's a big concern a lot of people have. Uh, there's a term spousal acceptance factor that, you know, sort of plays into this sometimes where you need to find uh, sometimes a compromise. Um, so, you know, it can be done. And, and I think the, you know, especially when you're working with a team like the uh, pros from Worldwide Stereo, they can kind of give you the options for a much uh, less intrusive, I guess you could say, set up with maybe in walls or something that's really going to deliver the most impact and immersive uh, experience possible, uh, but maybe isn't as much in terms of taking over the room and, and visually present. So uh, there's always a happy medium you can find. And, and g- in general, once people experience it for the first time, you know, with some of their favorite programming, you know, when my wife heard Game of Thrones with a 5.1 system as opposed to TV speakers, she was like, this is a completely different ball game like it's just so much different of an experience and so i think those are the kind of things that you know when people uh have lived with it they, it's hard for them to live without it going forward um so i think we've covered the the tv realm i think you know as far as projectors go it's it's more of a dedicated room i'll give you guys uh, uh brian just a second to maybe offer some insights on if you are in the market for a projector um maybe some of the things to consider because the budgets go crazy they can go from you know fairly entry level to ridiculously expensive so maybe Quickly talk about that, and then we'll move on to AV receivers. So uh, I always find one of the best things when you're doing a projection-based system is make sure that you're getting an equally good screen. Um, as the best projector you can have, if you're not going against a good screen, it's not going to come back to you with the right amount of light. Uh, you're just not going to get the performance value that you're going to get from it. Uh, also, when you're like thinking about projectors, um, a big thing right now in the industry is the ultra-short-throw projectors, which can now have a projection-based system in a room that would be difficult to do a uh, traditional projection system in where it has to hang in the back of the room. You have to have enough height in the room for you to not, you know, bump your head on it uh, or to, to shine on the back of your head. You know, you're, you're, there's a, a big concern with placement, also wire running. Wire running, you know, we, it's not difficult for us, but it can be difficult for the standard consumer where, um, a big portion now are jumping into that ultra short throw, which makes it easy where it's you're getting the 
size that you're looking for. Because, you know, when I always think home theater, I think of at least a hundred inch screen. You know, that's an immersive experience. That's something that that is going to be big and and, 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 and bold. Uh, and we're getting closer with that with uh, televisions now. Um, but the short, ultra short throws allow that in a standard room that you wouldn't ordinarily think would be set up for um, a projection system. But uh, yeah, my big thing really is it, you use as much of that wall as you can for your for your picture. Uh, I've had a lot of people want to flank the screen with the speakers uh, because they want to see their speakers. Uh, I've also set up a lot of rooms where we use a perforated screen so that the speakers can go behind the screen so they can get as much of that wall to be the screen as possible. Um, so it really comes to play into, is it going to be immersive enough for you as a visual impact? Uh, and is it going to, or do you want that? I want to see the big speakers that I just bought. Uh, and I want to see, you know, the equipment that I have. We have people set up with all the equipment in, in the front of them. Yeah, that's a perfect <laughs> example of a, yeah. a There's an extreme version right there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you have the dedicated space, this is a, a screen that actually lifts up. And you can see they have uh, multiple 16 Ultra SVS subwoofers uh, behind there. Um, that's an acoustically transparent screen. I don't think this is necessarily going to be in many people's wheelhouse, but it does show, you know, that... Uh, where we previously showed the living room, which was very much built into the decor. I don't think anyone would, would call this a living room. No, 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 no. But you'd be surprised at what some people will put in their living room. Uh, one That's of the biggest <laughs> systems that I did was in someone's living, was right off their kitchen in their living yeah. room. They did a 75 inch television with uh, two very big speakers. They did a whole Atmos system uh, because they were living in a house that they couldn't have a dedicated space with. But they had a giant subwoofer, giant speakers. Um, really, it's 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 where you want it. Uh, it it, it kind of plays into it. But the hiding the subwoofers like that, um, hiding it behind the screen, it really does that nice ambiance to it. Uh, our Ardmore store, uh, when we redid the theater there, uh, we actually have a lighting scene uh, that you press a button and it highlights behind the wall material lights will come on and you can actually see the speakers that we've hidden behind the screen the subwoofers we've hidden in the room mm -hmm. the speakers everywhere so you'll you can walk in and you can say hey i don't see any speakers and we press a button and you say wow there's actually a lot of speakers in this room and I, I do have to give a shout out. That last system we showed with the big lift up screen was a youth man from YouTube. He's a phenomenal resource, uh, all into different home theater products. And, uh, you know, he's tested a ton of different subwoofer speakers and, and video equipment. So uh, subscribe to his channel as well. I have to give him a shout because uh, he's really <laughs> built quite a phenomenal looking system there. And, and I can only imagine the sound of it. Um, so uh, check him out too, if you get a chance. Uh, all right. So We've talked about displays. We uh, we don't want to spend too much time on the video stuff because you know we are SBS, but um, we do have to talk about what I guess you could call the brains and the uh, the heart of a system, and that would be your AV receiver. Uh, mm -hmm. So what I'm going to pop on screen now is uh, basically the the rear shot of an AV receiver. And Larry, I'll kick this one to you first. Um, you know, th this can look a little daunting. You can see all these different connections and we're certainly not going to go through every single one because, uh, well, that would put you probably to sleep. Uh, but there are some essential things that you should look for when shopping for an AV receiver and building your home theater system. So Larry, why don't you uh, share some insights uh, on what people should think about when they're choosing their uh, AV receiver? Yeah. And this, this, like you said, Nick, might look a little scary to some people and really receivers have gotten so easy to set up. Uh, the most difficult part is going to be running your speaker wire and getting it where it needs to go. But when you're looking at a receiver, pretty much every receiver on the market today is going to do seven speakers or more. So you can do what's called 5.1 or 7.1, which is your five or seven speakers that are surrounding you. And then that point one is a subwoofer, or you can do what's called high channels. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. So you'll see a receiver that can maybe do what's called 5.1.2. And that last uh, decimal is the speakers that are up above you. And we'll get to that point. But what you're gonna wanna look for in a receiver, primarily for me, and I think when I'm talking to people is connectivity. And think of everything you're gonna hook up to that system. And a lot of people, I saw a question come up earlier about sound bars versus home theater. And over this last, two-year period, there has been this resurgence in home audio because, you know, we've all been home and soundbars are great for a particular need. 
But when it comes down to a true experience, it's really just loud television in most cases. So when you move into a home theater system, you got to think about all that stuff you're going to watch, your game systems, your streaming devices, your uh, Blu-ray or 4K, cable or satellite, uh, coming off of your television, whatever you're going to be watching, you need a connection for each of those. And the way this makes it simple for your family, because I know you'll, you'll all look at this and be like, oh, my family could never use this. And it's so not the case because if you run, say, your Direct TV box and your Blu-ray player and your Xbox and your PlayStation and everything into your receiver, you'll have one cable that'll go to your television. So you're not having to switch inputs all the time like many of you are now. And they all have a technology over the HDMI cable where they'll turn each other off and on. So you could literally turn on your PlayStation or your Xbox and boom, everything comes on. They've been doing that for years. So you can really make things easy. So having connectivity for each of your devices is key. Uh, you'll see a lot of connections on here that you're never going to use. And they're there more for like legacy equipment. So those red, green, and blue connections for component video, I haven't used that in 15 years. So, but it's there, you know, so you've got some uh, legacy capabilities. So you'll connect everything here and then run your video to the television and you can enjoy everything. And so connectivity is key. Power is another one, but it's not as big a deal uh, unless you're going very large all the way around with a lot of your speakers. But uh, my other son is getting home from school, so you're going to hear my dogs here in a moment. But really, it's it's connectivity. There they are. So you guys take over for a sec so I can mute. Good time to mute you, Larry. Uh, so Ryan, I'm curious. I mean, you must have people coming in all the time and, and they have no idea what they want as far as an AV receiver goes. Like, how do you get them started down the path of choosing the uh, the best option for them? Yeah, I usually ask them the speakers that they're going to be hooking this receiver up to. It's a really good starter question. Uh, make sure that the receiver that possibly I start yeah, thinking yeah, about is going to pair power. correctly, is can power those speakers correctly. Um, I usually ask them, hey, do you use zone two or zone three for outdoor or the dining room speakers to get music in? Um, I usually just like to give them as much flexibility as possible because maybe that's not a need now, but in the future it could be a need. So I don't like to handcuff my customers with, a single 5.1 or 7.2 receiver when they have two or three more rooms of audio. Um, with that being said, if it's a 7.2 now, I usually will talk to them, hey, did you think about adding a pair of size or adding another pair of Atmos? So I usually try to build upon that. So usually with that, I, I get them into like a seven or a nine, sometimes 11 channel receiver. If they don't wanna do separates, that's gonna power their system now, be able to, to do all the video switching that they wanna do. Um, but also grow upon in the future and make sure it's um, good for them years to come. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, future proofing is one of the, the things that you have to think about when choosing electronics. And I know that's been a frustration of manufacturers because a lot of these specs, I saw somebody mention HDMI 2.1 are constantly changing. And as somebody who has to build these receivers up to these new specs so people can take advantage of them, um, you know, it's really important as a consumer to understand what your needs are going to be five years down the road, because with a great audio system, it's not like a smartphone, like disposable technology that, you know, you're going to replace uh, every year or two. It's something that if you treat it well, it's going to last you 10, 15 years. Um, so buying a receiver that's really suited for your needs, not just today, but in 10 years uh, is important. And so, uh, you know, with that being said, Brian, I'm curious if there are any sort of cool trends or things you're seeing as far as receivers go uh, that you're excited about or that maybe consumers might not know about. Uh, so one thing I will say, uh, just in, in kind of tagged into future proving yourself, I'm a big proponent of separates a processor versus an amplifier and an amplifier versus everything into, into one uh, to future proof yourself. An amplifier tends to last so much longer than a receiver will in technology needs. So if you buy a processor, you can easily have everything that's latest and greatest for you right now. And then five years from now, you can trade that processor in for another processor, keep the same amp and you'll get all the new bells and whistles that are coming with you. But as you're asking about like, you know, what's down, what's, what's coming down the pike that people are really excited about when it comes to receivers. Uh, a big part of that is um, receivers that have the capability of doing uh, Atmos setup, uh, also the capability, the capability of doing eARC, which is the enhanced uh, audio return channel, uh, because a lot of content is coming from uh, people's televisions, uh, where in that same sense of, uh, you know, you might have a receiver that's not capable of doing the HDMI 2.1, you know, of the of the next generation gaming units, um, but the television is going to be capable of it. So a lot of people will do is actually connect their Xbox or their play, 
station five up to the television and then they'll have an hdmi cable that's going into going out of their receiver into the television and then the television actually has the audio return channel to go back into the receiver to feed it the audio uh, and using the e eARC will allow for that um, higher quality audio experience um, instead of a standard what people used to use is the optical cable or even further back down the, to uh, an analog cable um, the hdmi's eARC has that capacity of doing the higher definition audio formats that your better devices are going to play uh, another big thing I'd say with um, the newer receivers, uh, as we talk about HD audio, is the capability of hooking up a USB uh, cable to it and hooking up a computer to it to get high resolution audio as well. So it's that mix of the high definition television and high resolution audio to really bring out the most of what you can do with your system. Yeah. And there's, there's always ways that, you know, if you buy something that doesn't quite cover your needs, you can sort of patch it. You know, I, I see some people mentioning, you know, adding a separate to combine with the receiver. Um, we have our sound base unit, which can actually power a second zone and add wireless connectivity to a, an AV receiver that maybe doesn't have that capability. Um, so there are ways. So don't ever be afraid to ask a, what you might think is a stupid question. If your receiver doesn't, if you have one and it doesn't offer the existing functionality that you want, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you mean you need a new receiver, you could just add a component to it that might add that functionality. So um, we could probably spend an entire hour and a half just talking about HDMI, never mind yes. receivers in general. But we promised 101 and we're going to cover a lot of ground. And uh, we do want to get to speakers because uh, speakers are the fastest growing part of the SVS business, speakers and accessories, uh, believe it or not. And uh, you know, before we wa uh, talk a little bit about the tips in choosing them, and I see you have a beautiful Prime Pinnacle over your back shoulder. I have yep. a Prime wireless over my shoulder. And Larry, I know you got some Prime elevations floating around there. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's start with basically what makes up a 5.1 system. I think this is all about home theater and multi-channel uh, immersive surround sound. So we're not going to talk too much about stereo, um, but in sort of covering what stereo is all about, Larry, what do the front left and right speakers uh, handle in a home theater or even in a stereo setup? And so in, essentially they're what's happening in front of you. They're your front stage. So whether you're listening to music, watching a movie, the news, playing a video game, it's the front left and right are going to be where the most energy comes from in your system. So uh, whether it's something panning from left to right, talking happening on a screen, your main music, uh, it could be effects. It could be really anything that's essentially happening in front of you, either in a two-channel music system or in a movie or a broadcast. And then you kind of branch out to the other speakers in the system as well. But your front left and right are going to be your most important. So you'll see that a lot of people will either use a larger speaker up front or a tower and could possibly use smaller speakers around the space. Yeah, I, I think that's an important note. You know, depending on your room, a tower speaker is something that's going to be floor standing. So you don't have to create a stand or have furniture to place it on. Um, and typically you can place those basically wherever to create a wide soundstage. Um, you know, but the next and what a lot of people call the most underrated speaker channel is the center channel. And uh, Ryan, why don't you give a quick explanation of what the center channel's purpose is and why uh, for a lot of people, it's the most important speaker that's in a, uh, a surround sound system. Yeah, it is the most important. That's where all your vocals are going to come out of. Um, when that camera shot is facing that actor or singer talking, that's where a lot of that dialogue is going to come out of. Um, getting the right size center channel for your space and for your right and lefts, I usually dive into. So if they're getting a much larger pair of tower speakers, I usually like to get um, a larger center channel to match. Usually, if my case is doing a smaller channel with larger speakers, the center kind of gets lost. So keeping everything really even across it to sound uniform, there are some things I go over and, and like in a system for myself. Yeah, and I think when you're talking about placement of speakers on the front stage, which includes the center channel and the front left and right, um, you know, the picture you're seeing on screen doesn't have it perfectly. I, I think in an ideal scenario, the tweeters will always be lined up on an even plane, and that even plane will be as close to ear level as possible. So if you have the ability to match up those tweeters uh, on, a, on a level plane 
and roughly at ear level, you're going to get the most immersive sound possible. Uh, the other thing is when placing the center channel speaker, you always want to push it as close as possible to the front edge of furniture if it's sitting on the furniture, uh, because that reduces lobing, which is basically weird things that happen with the signal. Uh, when it comes out of the drivers, they can sort of bounce off the, uh, the furniture in front of it. Um, this one actually has a, a cool wedge that they use to basically project it right to the listening area. So they're making the best of a situation of not having those tweeters aligned and not necessarily having it at ear level or right to the flushed edge of the furniture uh, by putting uh, the sort of wedge that they, they have there. Uh, but these are just some tips that will help you get uh, the best sound possible in terms of placement, regardless of, uh, you know, of what the speakers you're choosing. And Larry, I know you're a strong proponent of three-way center channel versus two-way center channels. Maybe talk about the difference between those two before we get into yeah. some of the other channels. So as we're all saying, the center channel is your most important speaker. So if you look at the one that's there on the screen now, that is the prime center. And we have the ultra center, which is the step up. And both of the center channel speakers that we make use a three-way design. And what that means is there are woofers, mid-range, and tweeters all involved. You will find a lot of center channel speakers out there that only have a mid-range and a tweeter. And the tweeter is typically right in the middle. When you do that, you're missing out on a lot of range, a lot of vocal capabilities, a lot of dynamics that can be coming from that speaker. So by adding a three-way design, you get more frequency. And you'll hear me say stuff like all the way from uh, like Darth Vader to Mariah Carey and everything in between and all of the vocal capabilities that are there. And one of our favorite demos to do is actually from The Greatest Showman. It's this great scene. It's an operatic singing scene in the movie. And it goes from a whisper to just an all out wail when she's just unloading some notes in that particular scene. And you can hear the whispers, you can hear the details, but another real perk of having a three-way center channel is you can have a wider viewing environment. So if you've got a large family and you sit in a sectional couch and you're using a, a two-way center channel with just a mid-range and a tweeters, it's very directional. So if you want an example of that, just kind of put your hands on the side of your mouth and start talking and then move your hands and listen to how different it is. And that's the difference in a two-way and a three-way center channel is it's more broad. And that's why the center channels that we make are three-way center channels. So the experience is better, you get more range, and you're capable of just letting everyone really enjoy what you're talking or listening to without having to say, hey, rewind that, I didn't hear it. Yeah, and I think another important you know thing to mention about the center channel is there's a purpose in terms of the way it's it's actually built. Uh, you know, having that horizontal layout. Mm -hmm. Typically, you're going to have to put it below a screen. You want it anchored right in the center stage, right in the middle of that listening area. Um, but the reality is, and I don't know, uh, I'll throw this one to you, Brian. Like. Um, yeah. A lot of people make the argument that the best case scenario is to match your front left center in terms of the the, uh, the speakers you're using. So maybe speak to that and, uh, and why that's the case uh, when, when you're not choosing to use that horizontally laid out uh, speaker, center speaker. So, uh, I, you know, this is a good example of, 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 what, uh, of matching. Uh, you know, you're 100% you're going to be matching on that one because what's going to happen is when a sound pans through your front center stage, when it goes from the left to the right, it's all going to sound the same because all your speaker points are going to be in the same spot. Your tweeter is going to be in the same spot. So it's going to sound like if something came across the screen, screen it comes across in a straight line and, it, and, you, and you hear it all the same. If you would use something a little bit different, like a, uh, like a lesser speaker or, or, or something different in your center speaker, you might have a dip in that volume in the middle where it's going to sound like zip across and dump in the middle and then jump back up when it gets to the right. So when you're hearing something come across the front, you'll get a little bit more. However, there are a lot of speaker companies will match, have that center speaker tonally match their lefts and their rights, where you'll get, I would say, a better, you know, visual impact because I would want a bigger screen there instead of having a bigger speaker, uh, having a, a center speaker that can vocally match my left and my right um, to have it play well together. What I have liked in some occasions when we're looking at really wanting it to match up nicely and you want to have three speakers, I would do three center speakers across the front. So that picture that you showed before that had uh, two bookshelf speakers and a center speaker, I'd want three three-way driven speakers, center speakers across that whole front array. And then you'd have the same sound going through all of them because, you know, in that picture, that center speaker can probably overtake those lefts and your rights. 
Uh, but if I had three centers and, you know, cost wise, there, a center speaker to that bookshelf speaker is probably pretty close. You wouldn't be breaking the bank by jumping up uh, and getting three of those centers. You'd have a matching sound stage in the front uh, and visually they would match as well. And you could totally uh, put, you know, three of them like across the front and, and have it visually match. Or if you're going behind the screen, they'd be perfectly matched to go in. So. Wow. No, that's some great insight. And, you know, I think one of the broader points people can take away from this is there are no hard and fast rules where it's like you got to have two towers or two bookshelves for front left and you have to have a traditional center channel in the center. You go with what works best for your setup, you know, things that will work within the space you're given. Uh, and then obviously you want it to sound as good as possible. So that's where folks like Brian and Ryan and, and even the SVS sound experts can come in and, and offer some of that advice of like, okay, I see the limitations of your room. It's a very large open concept or it's a smaller living room. You know, this is the best product for you. And so, um, you know, it, you never have to feel like you're locked into any specific type of setup just based on what other people have recommended. Um, you know, because I know going into the forums and stuff like that, Strong opinions can emerge, but it doesn't necessarily <laughs> apply to your individual no. setup. So uh, keep keep an open mind when you're going that uh, direction. Um, so the next channels are, are often the hardest ones to place uh, because of where they're located, and that would be the surround channels. And uh, I'll throw this one to you, Ryan. Just talk a little bit about what the surrounds, uh, what their purpose is, and then we can give a little bit of insight on on the best way to set them up. Yeah, so not getting too deep. I just keep it simple when explaining. It's just it's just the effects. So anything that's coming down the left or right side, anything that's coming above you, those are your effect channels essentially. And occasionally, when people are talking off camera, like behind you in the bush talking, or that T Rex walking up behind you, snapping that twig in Jurassic Park, um, that's what that's going to play. And and those that placement is really important. So making sure for above and Atmos uh, when doing in ceiling, you want to make sure. There's about 33 to 55 degrees in front and behind that seating location. Um, a lot of this in ceiling speakers that we use, you can direct the tweeters back to you. Um, another scale up in performance, uh, manufacturers are, are just putting the angle on the center channel, or, sorry, in the surround, at, the surround speaker <laughs> um, to just be already directed back to you to help improve that. And, you know, I think what we're seeing on screen now, you see the the center channel, or I'm sorry, the surround channel over here on a, a stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got me, got me caught up in it. Um, you know, so there's, there's options. Like, I think ideally a lot of people want to put them on the wall because you don't take up yeah. any floor space. Um, so there's options uh, like the SVS Prime Elevation that can actually mount on a side wall, um, you know, or on a rear wall. And, you know, a lot of people have couches that are pushed up against the back wall. So they're always asking, you know, what's the best way to get that immersive effect if I can't actually put the speakers behind me? Um, you know, so typically getting them adjacent to you, but still firing in a, in a direction that sort of pro provides that immersive effect or even mounting them uh, on the back wall behind you uh, can be an option. So, you know, again, it's it's a matter of working with your space and creating the best scenario possible as far as, uh, you know, creating that immersive effect. Yeah, um, and, and work on it. You actually see we have that person in the watching the broadcast right now, the room you just showed. Steve oh, is that right? That's my room. We did a featured system with them on uh, on the SVS site, so I'm, I'm glad we can uh, use it as an example here for others. Uh, but Brian, I think you're going to say something. I was just going to say, like, uh, what's great about that room is like it, it is real wide and open. The speakers are off to the side. It could have been a great opportunity to use that wireless rear speaker effect that you had because it looks like he's got some glowing uh, uh, stuff underneath the, uh, the the couch there. So if he had power there, he could do that wireless receiver right underneath that and pop those speakers right next to the couch. Uh, but also the way he does have it really creates that room as a big party room to me because you're not limiting to, OK, I'm only on the couch. That's the only time I'm going to hear it. You're kind of encompassing the whole space, uh, really letting it play. Yeah. And uh, the next thing we're going to get into as far as speaker go, speakers go, which is one of the, I think, most exciting developments that's happened. And it's not necessarily a new technology, but I think as a lot of these streaming services have adopted it, uh, it's become much more prevalent and it's become much more desirable for people to have in their, their homes. And, uh, and that's Dolby Atmos and specifically height channels or height effects speakers. Uh, and I think it was Ryan was mentioning, or I think it was Brian, uh, about the using center channels in other parts of the room. Uh, but I'm going to pop up a system on screen, which sort of shows the extreme version of, uh, of a Dolby Atmos application <laughs> here. Um, but before we get into, you know, what's awesome about this, Larry, give us a quick uh, 101 level. What is Dolby Atmos and why is it cool? 
So Dolby Atmos, uh, there's a couple things that are in it. There's Dolby Atmos, there's what's called DTS-X, which is a DTS's version. And then there's uh, the Oro, uh, Oro 3D, which has a speaker called the Voice of God. And I see everybody's counting the speakers. This is really cool. <laughs> what Good luck is, finding a receiver that can handle all those channels, by the way. Yes, this is definitely separate. Uh, this is what's considered object-based surround. And what object-based surround is, is when the director, the audio engineer, the musician, whoever's involved with creating what you're enjoying, wants the sound to come from somewhere other than in front or behind you. So you will have where there will be things happening above you or maybe kind of catty cornered to your left ear or thrown at a 52 degree angle up above you, just random spots, wherever they choose to do it. And now with the new audio formats that are capable on 4K discs, uh, some streaming services, video games, you really get the ability to be totally immersed. There's no more, there's, there's a total bubble. There's no more gaps in sound. So you'll have different stages of sound. You'll have what's considered front height, which are the ones you see there on the screen that are up high mm -hmm. in front of you. You can have middle yeah. speakers, which will be on your sides and they're typically up high, or you can have rear height effects. And then you can also have that one that's like right there in the middle by the ceiling fan. That is an Oro Voice of God speaker. And that one's directly above you. So when you go to a movie theater now, you'll go in and you'll see uh, Cinemark XD, uh, the Regal, uh, whatever it's called, it's called like RPX, the uh, AMC Dolby Cinema, you'll not only see the speakers completely surrounding you, but also on the ceilings. And that is the newest experience in the home over about the last eight to 10 years. And what it does is it adds that total immersion. So uh, I know we're kind of running sh short on time, so I'll kind of bring all this together here. Um, if you're watching a movie, so for one of the best ones we all love to demo is Ready Player One. And there's a sequence, it's chapter two in the movie, and you all know I love my demos, uh, where there's a giant race with a couple hundred cars, and it involves driving through city streets, a subway crash, uh, dinosaurs, King Kong, and all that stuff. If you're watching that in a 5.1 or a 7.1, where all your speakers are kind of down around ear level, it's really awesome. It's cool. But whenever you add in the object-based surround up above you, when you are being chased down by King Kong or T-Rex or go through the subway crash that occurs in that race it totally goes above you. When you're being chased by King Kong from behind, you hear him breathing in front of you and stomping with his arms and legs behind you. And that's what Atmos brings. And you see, I get really excited about it because it is. It's the coolest thing to happen to home theater since Blu-ray came out. And you don't have to go out and have the biggest, best 4K screen. You can do it on Netflix. You can do it on Amazon. Uh, you can do it from a video game system. And when you do Atmos it totally changed the experience. And there's a bunch of different ways to go about doing it. We oh, do what you cut you there. off there, Larry, because I want the worldwide stereo guys to cover yeah. that. But I will say uh, what you're seeing here is what we believe is the most effective way to uh, deliver Dolby Atmos height effects or DTSX or RO 3D, which is with a cabinet speaker, which generally gives you better frequency response, uh, broader, you know, more of a, a full range experience. Um, but there are other ways that uh, are more virtual in terms of how you can deliver uh, Dolby Atmos effects. So uh, Ryan, I'll throw it to you. What, el what else can you do to get that sort of height effects object-based surround sound experience outside of mounting speakers high on a sidewall or on the ceiling? You could do some toppers right at the top of your um, left and right. Or even if you did towers or a larger bookshelf in the back, you could do uh, two pairs of toppers. I, I've done that a few times. With and by toppers, hand. these are actual speakers that sit on top of your tower speakers and, and do what? Yeah. Bounce? Yeah. Yep. So they'll deflect the sound off the ceiling into the seating location. Okay. And, and we're not here to great if you have a if, if you have a perfect room or a square room or a smaller room and low ceilings, they will work. But in a situation like this where you've got a ceiling fan, that can impact it. Yeah, that'll, that'll you have to kind of take those things into into. Yeah, equation. I think the biggest drawback of those is they're unpredictable. You know, depending on where your room is, where your seating position is, like you don't always get that perfect bounce that hits you right in the ears to deliver that sort of convincing effect. Um, but there's also virtual versions of Dolby Atmos. I think with a lot of sound bars now too. Brian, can you speak to uh, what that technology is all about? So, and it, it's kind of utilizing. Um, with some of the sound bars is the psychoacoustics of making it make you think that the audio is coming from a certain direction as opposed to a driver that's specifically going that way. So it's, it's, it's kind of 
playing with a speaker array uh, and, and giving you that ability to say, okay, um, the way that they tune the system, they can say, even though the speaker is lined up like this, it's going to sound like it's jumping out and over you and towards you and giving you those height level um, effects uh, when you're listening to it. So again, we believe, and this is why we designed Prime Elevation, that it is the most effective way to deliver these effects, just if you're purely looking at sound quality. Uh, but there are other less intrusive versions that you can go with. And also, you know, we should say Worldwide Stereo can do in-ceiling applications as well. So if you yeah, yeah. are able to run wire through your, uh, through your ceiling and cut holes in your space, um, then that's another option again. Cabinet speakers tend to give you better uh, acoustic properties, more full frequency range, uh, but that is an option too if you need that completely clean yeah. setup with your Dolby Atmos speakers. So. And I see somebody making a comment about toppers is the, the one thing you'll look at, there's three solutions really for doing Atmos. There's the topper, which is reflective, the end ceiling option, and, or a direct speaker coming at you. And a direct speaker is always gonna be best, uh, regardless of what you're looking at. And the reason for that is when you go to a movie theater, are the speakers in the wall? Are they in the ceiling? No, they are on the wall. They are on the ceiling aimed at you. And if you look at an, uh, an in-ceiling option or those toppers, they are limited in what they can handle and what they can output. So uh, we, there's people that go, oh man, my Atmos just doesn't sound like what I expected. And 99.9% .9 of the time it's related to how it's being delivered. All right, we, we have to save time for subwoofers, guys. We are- Yes, let's do it, so let's, let's rock. Go. I mean, 15 minutes here. I don't know that we did justice to the subs. We might have to go five minutes over, but uh, subwoofers, I, I think along with uh, Dolby Atmos, uh, probably even more so, uh, subwoofers provide the most impactful upgrade or addition you can make to your home theater here. Uh, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, you can see the largest SVS model, our 160 pound PB16 Ultra uh, super ported subwoofer. Oh, dude, it's bigger than uh, that, don't know our, sell it. Our most dainty seven yeah. pounds. <laughs> our, our, our most dainty yet no less impressive uh, 3000 micro subwoofer, which uh, I think you have to take eight of those to equal the weight of the PB16 Ultra. Um, but subwoofers are, just absolutely critical if you want to create that immersive effect as far as a home theater goes. Uh, and Larry, I'm not going to let you do this one. I want to kick it to the guys at Worldwide Stereo because I want to hear why they think a subwoofer is so important. So uh, Ryan, I'll start with you. What is a, what is the purpose of a subwoofer in your home theater? Plays the lower frequencies of the system where your, your speakers may not be able to handle. So it makes up for that bottom end. And you can come to different shapes and sizes that you can see. You can get a seal box. You can do a ported. So it really depends on how much air you want to move yeah. and really also how big your space is. So a lot of times is customer comes in with a big room plan. I'm like, hey, I want to we want to do a couple subs right up in the front or maybe caddy corner if space allows. So it's some things that we typically go over in the showroom. Yeah. And, and the subwoofer really does add that that oomph to everything like like it's it adds that punch, that feeling of everything that's going in there. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, omnidirectional in that feeling, because unlike the regular speakers where at the frequency that you're hearing that it's specifically pointed at you where a subwoofer, it's all around you. It's that immersive experience. And like I'm, I'm with Ryan, like I would do the more subwoofers, the better. Everyone always thinks that's a little bit too much, but that's always because they're thinking about subwoofers that are tuned too high, that you're just hearing bass. Um, but really, if you have a large theater room and you want different chairs and rows, they're all going to experience that subwoofer differently depending upon where it's placed in the room. Uh, and I've always found that instead of doing the giant subwoofer that you could fit seven of those little guys inside of, you know, do seven of those little guys around the room and just feel it and place them all around and, and, and really feel it um, tuned well. Uh, or if you can afford it, seven of those big guys, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you'll just feel everything. Yeah, it's funny. There's a lot, lot of times uh, people get into subwoofers and they they sort of uh, it, it becomes this addiction. It's like I can't get enough bass now, like now that I've got a taste of it. Uh, but typically the, the PB16 uh, ends up delivering uh, essentially what they need to to meet that fix for bass. Um, you know, and I think one of the interesting and, and the greatest parts about subwoofers is that when people have never had one and they add one to an existing speaker system, oftentimes what they say is, I've never heard my speaker sound better. And that's 
a lot because it takes some of the strain off of them having to handle the low frequency. So most home subwoofers are powered, so they don't require any amplifier power. They just have uh, the audio signal coming to them, which frees up a little bit of power for the uh, the multi-channel system uh, to open up that mid-range and the you know the higher frequencies. And you know, essentially, it, like you guys were saying, it provides that presence of energy in the room, whether it's like a chest thumping slammed or an explosion, or a lot of times it's super subtle, a quieter scene where you just sort of feel something rumbling in your seat and you know there's like an ominous, you know, something coming down or, uh, you know, even with music, it's just, it allows you to just feel what the artist intended you to feel a little bit more clearly. Um, so with all that sort of uh, fun flowery stuff out of the way, Larry, what are the differences between a ported and a sealed subwoofer for those people who may be uh, just getting into the game? So we, we do three types of subs as, uh, as a brand, and most brands will do one or two, sometimes two types. So we do sealed subs, which you see there on the right of the screen. That is going to be a, not necessarily as compact as that one, but a smaller design with a completely enclosed cabinet. So the ecosystem is totally inside there. So it's the amplifier, the driver, the cabinet, all enclosed. And they're great. They're, it's what I use in every room of my house, excluding my downstairs space. And I'll get to that, why we do that. But a sealed sub is great at everything and poor at nothing. That's a great way to look at it. That's one of the lines that we love to say with our subs because they're, they're great for music, great for movies, great for gaming, daytime, nighttime, very versatile in everything that they do and very fast. And given that they're more compact, you can typically put more in a room. And I see a lot of questions coming up when we were talking multiples. You don't have to do multiples. But if you can, it gives you a better listening area. It eliminates a sweet spot. So if you can put maybe two sealed subs up in the front of your room or one in the front, one in the back, you'll get a great balance. But that's also where ported subs come into play. A ported subwoofer will be larger well, when you're looking at SVS, the ported subs are 60% larger than the sealed version of it. And the reason for that is we're going larger because we're moving more air. And when you do that, when you look at a, an SVS ported subwoofer, you will see those large ports on the front. They're three and a half to four inches in diameter. And inside it's 12 to 20 inches long of tubing inside there too. And each of them are tuned for separate frequencies. And that's what allows the subwoofer to go lower and i don't want to get too geeky but an svs ported sub versus a sealed will go deeper on the lower frequency octaves typically about three hertz or more so if our sealed sub hits that golden note of the 20 hertz that you can't hear but you feel the ported version will go three hertz lower but at the same time will be twice as loud on your volume output so if you are somebody that listens to your receiver at the same volume all the time. If you were to replace your sealed sub with an SVS ported sub, it would be twice as loud. But the real perk there is at lower volumes, it's more present. And because it does go lower, it will take on a larger space. So my living room, like we were talking earlier, is open concept. I have one of our cylinder subs in my living room because my TV sits in a corner, the cylinder sits right behind it. You have no idea it's in a room and it being ported takes on that larger area. So when you go to a movie theater, they're using ported subs because there's more space, there's more air that needs to be uh, compensated for. But one of the real big perks of our subwoofers, uh, any of the ported models, you can turn sealed. And so there's people that prefer the big thunderous IMAX level base of a ported sub, but also want the speed of a sealed subwoofer. So you get the best of both worlds with our ported subs. And the way you do that is there's an app control and you download our free app, it controls it and allows you to make all kinds of adjustments, but you can change the subwoofer from a ported subwoofer to a sealed sub. So if you want that quicker response for music, but that over the top experience for movies, you can totally do that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, you can have the best both worlds with the ported, but the sealed often blend better into your room. They're a little bit more accurate in frequency response. They have quicker, crisper speed and transients, which is I think what you alluded to as being faster. So they can stop and start on a dime a little bit more cleanly than a ported subwoofer. Uh, and you know, I think the, the old sort of adage is that sealed is better for music, 
Portage is better for home theater. It's not that cut and dry, you know, depending on what kind of music you like, depending on what your room is like. If it's a massive room, you probably want to port it. So there's a lot of variables that, you know, the Worldwide Stereo team can walk you through uh, or the SVS team to kind of get you to the best place possible. Um, you know, but with that being said, I think you addressed a little bit of the benefits of, of going dual or having multiple subwoofers. Uh, but Brian, maybe just uh, bring that home as far as why you would want to go uh, dual as far as the benefits of that. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest benefits that what I found is really it, it is that coverage. Uh, but even when, um, you know, I was testing out the SB1000, the PV1000 at my house, um, I set them up as the front stereo pair. So um, I could play, you know, it, it would match, you know, with the left speaker would have its own subwoofer, the right speaker would have its own subwoofer uh, and really get that, that, that good balance out. But it re I really did find that it, it, it does good, get good coverage of the room itself is having the, the multiple subs. And, and really when you're coming, especially if you have one of the, the, the giant ported sub, if you have that blaring at you uh, in, in, in your front space, like you're just going to feel that. Um, where, you know, if we had this room set up and Ryan's sitting on my right and I'm sitting on the left and the subwoofer's off on his right, he's going to get more of the sub than I'm going to get. And in reality, we should both be getting everything uh, when, it, when it comes to play. So it really does balance out the, the sound in the front. I think it also balances out the look. I'm very symmetrical person. So having, you know, a left speaker, center speaker, a right speaker, then a subwoofer and then a big empty space, in my mind, I'm just like, ah, I could fill a sub, put a, a, a sub there and really finish it out. And to me, you can also get, you know, instead of buying the, the one big giant sub, you get two subs very similarly priced for the same as one giant one. You're going to get that benefit of, uh, of coverage um, and you're just going to get that, you know, more fulfilling sound. Or you get the two giant ones. If you yeah. Can. I think one of the knocks on subwoofers is that uh, they're not often the uh, best uh, for making friends. If you have a shared wall or, you know, maybe you have <laughs> younger or other family members who don't necessarily want to watch movies at reference volume at 11 p.m. at night. Um, so if that's the case, there are some solutions here. And, uh, you know, I'm, what I'm showing on screen is one from SVS. This is our SVS SoundPath subwoofer isolation system. What this does, it basically fits on any subwoofer, SVS branded or not, and it decouples it from the room. So essentially all that energy that may be uh, yeah. <laughs> injected into the floor and the walls, and it's causing, you know, pictures to rattle and, you know, light fixtures to shake upstairs, or in Larry's case, his wife's makeup to fall in the toilet. Uh, uh, you know, these are things that you can help mitigate against. I'm so having... tired of hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you have something like this, which is a, an inexpensive solution. There's also risers and there's other ways that you can, uh, you know, basically uh, attenuate for some of the issues that are caused by large output subwoofers. Uh, and specifically with the app uh, that Larry had mentioned, there's a, there's multiple modes that you can set up. So you can actually adjust levels and have it saved as a preset or if you want to dial it down and call it nighttime mode. So maybe it's not running, you know, it's hot when you're uh, playing it late at night, or if you want to adjust it for music, you can do so and have it at the touch of a button and not like the old where you have to go behind, turn the knobs and try to get it to the point you want. So there are options out there. Um, I did want to get to a couple Q and A's uh, before, yeah. but one other thing I just wanted to share as far as tips go, uh, because I know one of the biggest things as far as people setting up their home theaters is uh, is wire management, and uh, not everyone wants to see wires snaking all throughout their home, and uh, and have that be the the thing that's the visual focal point. So uh, maybe Ryan, offer a, a quick up uh, just knowledge on on what you can do to hide wires and uh, and i have one example here on screen but some of the things that you guys can do to help people uh, yeah. with uh, with this issue so if basement you get if all your studs are all run in the same direction where your receiver is going to end up um, you can make some smaller holes behind your tv cabinet to get up into the ceiling to fish down to, uh, to your speaker locations we've done that um probably if you don't mind the look of wire mold um, some of our mold that can also be done to just run up from the bottom of the top, uh, drop ceiling. If you have a drop ceiling, pop, start popping ceiling tiles, start running all your wire, um, down to your ceiling, into your on wall speaker for your heights or for your surrounds. Um, that's, there's just some little wins as we call it in the, in the retro world when we're, when we're doing <laughs> time saver. Yes. Yes. I, I always say that, um, fixing a drywall hole that's this big versus this big. It's the same amount to, to fix it. So if you just make the bigger hole, uh, it's actually easier to fix a bigger hole than it is a smaller hole. So often you just cut 
I'm not afraid to cut in and, and, and kind of see where it's going to go, especially if a speaker that big. You got a lot of space to, to kind of cut a hole in, get your arm up, kind of see where you can go. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities for hiding things. And, you know, it also depends on what kind of area you have. You know, if you don't own a home, you rent an apartment, you're not going to be cutting holes in the walls and, and, and running rot wires through the attic like I did at my last apartment. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a wire bulb, uh, what's nice about that is it's often paintable. So you can kind of have it kind of hide into the room. So you don't have this big white stick that's hanging on the wall, <laughs> hiding the, the speaker cables. Um, they also make um, some flat wire speaker cable. If you've ever seen that, yes. instead of it being rounded, it's a, it's, it's super flat where you can run it underneath the carpet. Um, so there's a lot of neat little ways that you can hide wire. Yep. I think that's all great advice. And again, no room's the same. So maybe some speakers you have to use that solution and other ones like Larry, you can hide it behind a foam finger on your wall, uh, from the last Dallas Mavericks game you went to. Uh, so, you know, it just depends on what's, uh, what's available to you and what your room setup is like. Do you guys mind hanging for another five minutes? We'll jam no, through a couple of questions go. and then we'll do our giveaway. Cause I know people are excited about that. Uh, so we're going to do this, like what we call SVS happy hour lightning round style. So you got about right. 30 seconds to a minute and I'll call you out. And, uh, and try to keep it to 30 seconds. We'll get to as many questions as, as we can. So, Larry, I'm going to start with you. Ben Smith asks, he's building a 13-channel, which is impressive, surround sound system. In your opinion, which is best, 9.2.4 or 7.2.6? And this is in a roughly 22 by 18 by 9-foot room. That's a, that's a good size room. I'm always going to go high every chance you get because I think the height effects make the yeah, best experience all the way around. But if you're talking nine channels of surround on the lower level versus seven, it, it really doesn't make all that big a difference. So I'm going right. to do seven down low, six above. Time's up. Good. Good answer. All right, Ryan, this one's for you. Robert Cruz asked, do you have any advice on optimizing or enlarging the sweet spot for a couch, I assume the listening area. Uh, when you listen to the sweet spot, it's pretty much one chair. How can you make that sweet spot bigger? Oh, geez, that's a tough one. Um, what do you think, Brian? I don't know. Those are the questions for you. I know. I, I have a good one if you guys want. Go for it. I, I, I sold out my middle house. Sorry. Throw your speakers a little bit a different direction, and that will make a huge difference. So Try towing your in your speakers in or out can make a big difference. Uh, pulling your speakers either closer or further away from you can change that too. You know, yeah, I think that's a great one. Depending on the angle, yeah. or there could be obstructions in front of them too. Maybe there's some furniture that's cutting off part of the signal. So look at your setup and, and just angling them can be an effective way to do that. And Lance, change your speaker from large to small. That, yeah. <laughs> that'll probably open things up night and day. Yeah, yeah mess with the settings too. That's not a, not a bad idea. Lance Short asks, what's the best way to boost the overhead sound coming from uh, Atmos in, in terms of from the receiver or just in general? The systems that he hears are hard to hear uh, as far as the output goes. So uh, I'll just leave that one out, whoever wants to answer. How do you boost Dolby Atmos sound? Brian, you got it. I'm going to buzz in on this one. Uh, amplify it and get a, get a better amplification. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can have the, the same, like a lot of times people downgrade what their amplification is for their surround sound speakers or their Atmos height speakers, and they don't give them enough oomph. So if you have a better amplifier, you're going to get more from that speaker, even at a lower volume, because it's going to be able to power it better. So I, you know, for a long time, I've always said you can underpower a speaker, you can't overpower one. Yeah. And also in the receiver, you can boost the output levels. I know Larry, that's one of your hacks, right? After you've run the room correction. Yeah. Run, run your room correction. Make sure your speaker set. I will tell you guys right now and gals that the most things that come up have to do with speaker settings. And the most common call we get to our sound experts is it just doesn't sound like it should. And that's because in most cases, a receiver recognizes a smaller speaker as large. So setting it to small, getting those crossovers correct, and then bump up your levels. That's that's really easy to do if you're running a, just an AVR you know, bump up your rears or your height effects, maybe plus two, plus three, and you'll get that. I'm in a small room here, 11 by 13, and my height effects and my rear channels are, are bumped up a bit just because it's cool. One thing I see that people always miss with that is they don't measure the distance from their speakers. So they'll, they'll, they'll make the changes for the, the, the volume that goes to the individual channels, but they won't go into the receiver and measure the distance that they're sitting from the speakers. And if you get a nice little laser tape measure, you sit in one spot, you just point it at all the speakers, put that in, you'll actually hear a big difference because the uh, receiver's going to try 
to make sure that they're hitting you in that sweet spot. And the more calculations that you put into your receiver of saying, yeah, my left speaker's 15 feet from me, my right speaker's 15.4, my cell phone is 20 feet, my rear speakers are three and four feet, it comes to realize, okay, this is the environment that I'm living in. And then when you do your um, room calibration, it'll go, okay, these are my distances. Let's uh, see how we make it work with it. Next question from uh, Rafael Rodriguez and uh, and Ryan. I hope you give the right answer to this one because it's sort of a trend-oriented question. <laughs> do, do you guys think that we are moving away from sound bars and heading back towards the full surround five and seven channel speaker systems? I do, yeah. I think right. that it's, it's going back to more of the AVR. I, I'm dealing with more and more customers that are kind of getting away from the sound bar because, hey, I got this space. What can we do? I, I want that immersive experience. Uh, this sound bar just... Um, isn't cutting it. And at the same time, there's some manufacturers out there that are creating more of immersive sound bars that are around the same price point as a AVR or maybe a smaller AVR package as well. So it's it's sort of coming in different shapes and sizes now. It's going to get a lot tougher. Yeah, on some level, sound bars were sort of the greatest thing to happen to surround sound because people realize, oh, I can have something better, but it's not quite good enough. And you know, I, I think that's what's uh, been a great sort of Trojan horse for people to take that next step. Um, all right, here's a, a dual subs placement question for you, Larry. Matthew Wells asks, when using two subwoofers, do you put them one in the front, one in the rear, front left, side to side? What's the best practice here, or is there? Yes. Yes. So that's there's there's no real right or wrong answer here. You can put them wherever. I will tell you, first thing to do, do your subwoofer crawl, put one subwoofer in your chair, walk around, find where it's kind of hammering you the most, put it there, and then do it a second time with uh, both subwoofers going and find the points where the subwoofers in your room are impacting you the most. And then when you sit back down, that's where you will get that total enjoyment. So I, you'll normally see in a two subwoofer system, typically caddy cornered, uh, tends to be our most popular or inside the front speakers or just outside the front stage. I, I really like them on the sides because I, I think it kind of adds uh, a little bit of immersion, but um, it, it really comes down to also where they fit. So, yeah, it's much more not forgiving. A right answer. Yeah, running two subwoofers, so much more forgiving than having a single one. Um, but I should mention that with a, a sealed subwoofer specifically, you can take advantage of what's called room gain. Uh, more so than with a ported subwoofer, where actually the uh, the base signals, and I'm terrible at explaining the science behind this, uh, you're taking the energy within the room and the ways the signals are interacting with the room, where if you place it correctly, you can actually boost the dB levels and the low frequency extension just by the place where you're, where you're actually setting it up. So um, there's a science to that that I'm sure uh, the folks at Worldwide Stereo or uh, SVS can help explain better, uh, but something to note about the sealed subwoofers. So I think we got two more questions I'm gonna throw out here and then we'll do our giveaway. The good doctor, Alfred Scott asks, and I'll throw this one to you, Brian, do you need an AVR if you plan on just running a 2.0 or 2.1 system? Do you need an AVR? That's a very good question because if you're gonna run a 2.1 system, yeah. um, and you're, it really depends on what kind of video switching or uh, any, what you're looking for it to do. So in that kind of scenario, I'd probably do, as I talked about before, uh, a preamp with a solid two, like two channel amplifier. And I, what that will allow you to do, this is what I think will be my favorite part with that is, um, if you start with a preamp and a solid two channel amplifier and you have those two speakers, at any point you can buy another amplifier and add more speakers to it. So I would love to see someone say, I'm gonna spend more money on my left speaker, my right speaker and my subwoofer that first go round. And if they don't ha get that experience that they're looking for, on another amplifier, at another set of speakers, and they're just, you, you give your, yourself room to grow. Uh, so as an AV receiver, um, you can still do that. You'll have that room to grow. There are actually some receivers that will do, um, uh, you can bridge the amplifier inside of it where you can say, I'm not using my surround speakers. So you can change my 80 watt uh, per channel to 160 watts per channel, which could be a real big benefit if you're doing an, a, an AV receiver in a 2.1 channel uh, scenario. But yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of starting at stereo and just moving moving up from there. 
you went slightly over your time there, but it was good information. So I'll, I'll let, I'll let <laughs> you off the hook. And the only other thing I'll say is, uh, you know, this is a shameless plug for SVS, but there's also a range of integrated amplifiers out there like the SVS prime wireless sound base, which provide two channels of amplification, 300 Watts. They also allow you to wirelessly stream. They can connect to a TV via optical. It's a much smaller unit than what you would get from a, a big AV receiver. So if you're using it for just music, or you just don't want something as as large, or you're not going to need that upgrade ability to get to a multi-channel surround sound system, then something like the Prime Wireless Sound Base, which is uh, you know much more compact but will still give you all the power that you could ever need from bookshops to towers, uh, is a great solution for uh, for meeting the needs of a two-channel setup. Uh, so our last, oh, go ahead. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> our last question, uh, I'll throw this one to you, Larry. Uh, I think we addressed it a little bit, but uh, Jorit Winters asks, how important is the receiver RMS to the speaker? Can you actually damage the speaker by giving it too little power? Not really, but I mean, you you can, but it's it's more if you're just cranking it too much and you're really trying to destroy it. it most uh, receivers that are on the shelves today are going to power really anything that's out there, unless you're starting to get into some really high-end, super power-hungry speakers. So uh, if you go look at any, say, mid-range to higher-end receiver, they'll power any of our speakers just fine. If you do underpower them, you're just going to be underwhelmed uh, and just not get the enjoyment out of it. Yeah. So it's really a matter of, you know, finding uh, what's within your budget. And, you know, if you want to step up eventually, you can always add separates and, and you know, get more out of them. Uh, but, you know, you get out what you put in. So it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, underpowering them, certainly not going to damage it. Um, so before we announce our giveaway winner, uh, I did want to thank Brian and Ryan for uh, being with us tonight and, and the Worldwide Stereo team. You can always visit them or their teammates in the Ardmore or Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania locations. They got phenomenal showrooms. They got all sorts of technology outside of speakers and subwoofers and uh, video equipment for you to check out. So uh, if you're driving through or in the area, I strongly suggest you go there. Thank you to my colleague, Larry, for being here tonight as well. We will actually be coming to you live again next Thursday at the SVS Audiophile Happy Hour, where there will be more giveaways, uh, slightly more silliness, and also maybe slightly less knowledge, but we'll still have fun. Uh, so check us out next Thursday on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Um, and with that being said, our winner for the evening of the Prime Satellite 5.1 system with the SB1000 Pro Sub for the cables, and should I forget, the Worldwide Stereo Swag, which includes a T-shirt, and a logoed water bottle is Bruce Reed from YouTube. Congratulations, Bruce Reed. Awesome. Uh, feel Congratulations. Free to email our teams with your shipping information. We'll also track you down uh, via YouTube to get your information. Bruce Reed, congratulations. Thank you for attending. And thank you for everybody in the community who offered such great questions and feedback. We love you guys. Always appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we'll look forward to doing this again, hopefully down the road uh, sometime in 2022. So yes. happy holidays to all and, uh, and happy listening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.